tonight. This is, this is uh, session number two on Old Testament for Dummies. <laughs> and uh, we're going to study the Torah tonight, also known as the Pentateuch. Penta means five, five books. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So this will of necessity be kind of a whirlwind study tonight. On page one of your notes, you have a brief review. The Old Testament is composed of 39 books. The Torah, which we are studying tonight, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then two weeks from tonight, we will study the historical books. And I have a great passion for the historical books. How we'll get through all of that in one night, I'm not really quite sure, but we're going to give it a shot. The historical books, 12 of them, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are fabulous stories in those 12 books. And then we'll do the poetical books next. That's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Then we'll do the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, who also wrote the book of Lamentations. He wrote that as Jerusalem was burning in 586 B.C. after the Babylonians tore it apart. Book of Lamentations will rip your heart out. And then Ezekiel and Daniel, two Hebrew young men who were carted off to Babylon, to Iraq, by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar and who had incredible careers for God in the service of the Lord in Iraq. Be very up-to-date books. Then the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those are great names, aren't they? If some of you are going to have more children and one of them will be a boy, Habakkuk would be a great name. In the uh, first chapter of Matthew, you have the genealogy of Jesus, and there was a one of his ancestors was named Sadoc, S-A-D-O-C. And a lot of people have called their son Sadoc. I mean, you hear it all the time, Sadoc. And, uh, <laughs> you're bitter people, you know that? You're just bitter, bitter people. Well, let's get into the Torah. Our wonderful Jewish friends are heavily into the Torah. It's the key text in Judaism. They will read from the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, the law, in virtually every service they do from the synagogue. They will open up the ark, which is what holds those wonderful, wonderful scrolls, those magnificent scrolls that contain these five books, and they'll read from them. These books almost entirely were written by Moses. The Torah is known as the Law of Moses, Pentateuch, which means five books. The Torah gives the history of the world from its creation through the migration of the Jews to Egypt under Joseph. We'll talk about how long a period that could have been in just a moment. When the Torah was given by God to Moses is a matter of debate. Now remember, all Scripture is given by God. All Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it was given through 40 different persons, the Old and New Testament, over a period of 1,500 years. God did not zap them with lightning and put them into a trance. He moved upon them, and they began to write as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. So you will, read, you will read different personality inflections in all of these books. It wasn't just some man unconscious writing as a, as a ghost moved his hand in the quill. 
their personalities are very strongly there. Paul's, in, Paul's personality comes through like gangbusters. Marx does too. Luke, uh, and then throughout the Old Testament, the, the words of David, oh my goodness, the words of David, and so forth. Now, the law was given to Moses when? Some hold that all five books were given to Moses during his communion with God on Mount Sinai, about 1280 B.C., uh, those of you who are students of the Old Testament and of history sometimes will read books that will say instead of 1280 B.C., it will say B.C.E., which stands for Before the Common Era. If they do not want to acknowledge Christ, they will say B.C.E., Before the Common Era. <laughs> but it's still Christ. <laughs> I went to some lectures in Israel and uh, one of the teachers there, dear lady, wonderful teacher, was teaching us, and she kept saying BCE. And I said, what is that? Before the common era. Oh, I said, before Christ. She said, no, no, before the common era. It's before Christ. Others believe the books were given to Moses by God throughout all of his life, and Moses' life is divided into three segments, zero to 40, as the prince of Egypt, 40 to 80, as a shepherd out on Mount Sinai, 80 to 120 when he died as the leader of Israel. Uh, still others believe the majority of the five books were told to Moses by God throughout his life, but other passages, such as those describing Moses' death, were later written by Joshua or some other prophet. I probably hold to that position. Now let's get started in Genesis. And uh, remember, this is a class, and if you have questions, uh, all you have to do is ask, and then we'll find somebody that gets you an answer. Genesis means the beginning. The book of Genesis states many things for the first time. We read for the first time about creation, about man, woman, sin, Sabbath or Shabbat, marriage, family, labor. In fact, we even read about unions for the first time in Genesis. Civilization, culture, culture. One lady said to her husband, if you didn't eat yogurt, you wouldn't have any culture at all. <laughs> Murder, sacrifice, races, languages, redemption, cities. Interesting. The book of Genesis tells us the fascinating stories of some of Earth's greatest characters. Adam, first man. Noah, good man. Nimrod, bad man. Abraham, Sarah, what a pair they were, Abraham and Sarah. Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, Joseph and his brothers, the pharaohs of, of uh, Egypt under the Hyksos dynasty. Fascinating characters. The question that we probably need to deal with here was when was creation? And uh, whatever your response and your answer is, it's as good as mine and they vary, and uh, I don't get very adamant about this because I really don't know when creation was. I just figure it was a long, long, long time ago. But I won't be totally evasive, and I will tell you what I think, but this is not AG theology. It's not the official position of First Assembly. It's just what I think, and I could be wrong. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I personally believe in a pre-creation that was destroyed, hence Genesis 1, 1, and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. A better rendering of that second verse from the original Hebrew will say, and the earth became without form. God created the heavens and the earth, and then somehow, in the process of time, the earth became formless and void. Why? 
Well, there's a lot of conjecture about that too, and there are some great, great arguments on both sides of the fence. I believe that this is the time when God put down Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, when Lucifer, star of the morning, who becomes Satan, decides to unseat God to take his position. Isaiah gives us this story in detail. And one third of the angels followed him. We know there are still a hundred million, at least, good angels in heaven, so there must have been 150 then at that time. So at least 50 million angels, and it could have been infinitely more, followed Lucifer in this abortive attempt to unseat God. Peter also tells us that God sent them out of heaven, threw them out like shooting stars, and he sent them to the earth. It's my opinion, it's not theology, it's my opinion that at that, that is the time that the earth became corrupted and became without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Dear J. Vernon McGee, who still speaks to us every morning from the grave, and I love his teaching, said, um, the first 11 chapters of Genesis cover a minimum span of 2,000 years. Now that would be those who hold that the earth is 7,000 years old, which I don't believe. Actually, 2,000 years plus, McGee wrote, I feel it's safe to say that they may cover several hundred thousand years. I believe this, is, this first section of Genesis can cover any time in the past that you may need to fit into your particular theory, and the chances are you'd come short of it even then. Um, just, just my opinion, but I, I really believe the earth is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. But I wasn't there, so you say you're wrong. I could well be wrong. There's no point in debating it and arguing about it because nobody really knows. I just don't believe the earth is 7,000 years old for a lot of reasons. In Jericho, when we go to Jericho on our trips, uh, we go to the ruins of the city that predate Joshua by a long time. Anything that Joshua destroyed has vanished off the face of the earth, long gone. And the ruins that you see in Jericho predate Joshua by thousands of years. They predate the pyramids in Egypt by thousands of years. <clears throat> and in one of those pits, uh, archaeologist uh, Kenyon, Kathleen Kenyon, uncovered an old watchtower. And historians and archaeologists believe it is the oldest man-made structure on the face of the earth, predating the pyramids by at least 6,000 years. And that old tower is about 10,000 years old. I've had the joy of climbing all over it. You're not supposed to, but I did. And looking down inside that old tower, it's an incredible thrill to see the pyramids, but it's an even greater thrill to climb that old tower and know that you're standing on a man-made structure that existed 10,000 years ago, maybe 10,000 years before Christ. It's very, very old. The thing that's disconcerting is when you look inside it and somebody spray painted on the inside of it, Kilroy was here. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. So the earth is very, very, very old. And whatever you want to believe on it, you're probably right. You're probably right. The time span in Genesis from Abraham now to the birth of Jesus was about 2,000 years. So it's pretty fascinating here. For the first 11 chapters, we have, we don't know how many eons of time are covered in that span between chapter 1 and chapter 11. But from the time of Abraham on to the end of Genesis, the 50th chapter, is about is a lengthy period of time, and clear to Jesus is 2,000 years. God does not tell us in his book everything we'd really like to know about creation. And I give you in the box down there a very interesting example. In Genesis 1:16, the Holy Spirit anointed Moses to write, he made the stars also. 
That's just as frustrating to me as it can be. Five words, he made the stars also, to discuss the creation of all the constellations, planets, stars, space, five words. And yet in this same book, he takes 12 chapters to tell you the story of Joseph. Five words for the creation of space, 12 chapters to talk about Joseph. Why? Because God, God's great interest is not the stars, constellations. God's great interest is redemption. Redemption. That's why the church must be in the redemption business. I don't know why we would think that God is so interested in our things and our structures when he wasn't particularly even interested in the construction of space. What he's really interested in is the redemption of man. That's what most of the Bible is about. And that's where the focus of the church always has to be. Page four, if you like Paul Harvey, page four. That's Genesis, just in a nutshell. And we really race through that very quickly. Exodus, remember this is a survey course, so we're just touching on this. But when you all read through the Bible in 90 days, it'll help you, and you can do that. Everybody said, amen. amen. Exodus means exit or the way out. It is the absolutely fabulous story of God's taking several million Jews who were slaves in Egypt out of that land of the Nile as they began their long, arduous trip to the promised land. The lead character in this story is Moses. Exodus continues the story which was begun in Genesis when Joseph and his family go down to Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis, Pharaoh said, I want you to come down to Egypt. So Joseph, who was the prime minister, brought all of, the, all of his family down, and they settled in the very fertile Delta Nile, which was known as the land of Goshen. Did you ever hear that phrase, well, land of Goshen? Those of you who are my age can remember that. That used to be a, our swear word. Well, land of Goshen. <laughs> And it's a real place. Like Beulah Land is a real place. You think about Beulah Land. The land of Goshen was the fertile Nelta, uh, uh, the uh, delta of the Nile, or the Nelta of the Dial, whichever one you are. <laughs> but between Genesis and Exodus, and this is important for you to know this, there's almost four centuries lapse. Here's where your history, your knowledge of history is going to really help you. Between the end of Genesis and the start of Exodus, you have about 400 years. Genesis 15, 13 says the seed of Abraham would spend 400 years in Egypt. That's in that box. Exodus 12, 40 says it was 430 years. Galatians 3, 16 and 17 confirms it. I'll read you those scriptures. Genesis 15, 13, and he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed your, and your progeny will be stranger in a land that is not theirs. God never gave Egypt to the Jews. He gave them Israel. So they were strangers in a land that was not theirs, Egypt. And you'll serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now in Exodus 12, 40, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And then Galatians 3, 16 and 17 from the New Testament, the New Covenant. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of money, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So we have confirmation here again and again that the sojourn of the Jewish people in Egypt under the pharaohs was about 400 and some years. 
Genesis 46, 27, near the end of the book of Genesis, tells us that when Joseph was down in Egypt and he brought his father, Jacob, down and the brothers and hit their families, it was about 70 people. The sons of Joseph, which were born in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came unto Egypt, were three score and ten. Joseph was married off to an Egyptian gal. They had two sons. And then Jacob, his dad, and all the family came down at the invitation of the Pharaoh, about 70 people in all. But it is conservatively estimated that at least 2.1 million Jews left Egypt at the time of the Exodus. And it could have been a whole lot more. Some estimates go as high as 7 million. But let's just take the 2 million because that's a sure thing. Now think that through a minute. How'd they cross the Red Sea? God parted the Red Sea. And they walked across on dry ground. Now, if you, if you remember the Ten Commandments, which is not a great movie, by the way. <laughs> Terrible acting in that. Oh, let's see this thing which God hath made. It's called the wooden tree method of acting. Um, God parts the sea very badly in the Red Sea, by the, in, the, in the Ten Commandments, by the way. Uh, the original God could do it better. Part of the Red Sea, and it was kind of this narrow corridor. But we get these things in our mind, and behind them, here comes Yul Brynner, Pharaoh, <laughs> pounding across the sands with his armies to annihilate them. Do you know how long it would take to get over two million people down that narrow corridor? That'd still be crossing over there. That must have been a wide, wide path. Huge. At least several miles across. At least. Same thing when the Jews crossed the swollen Jordan River into the Promised Land in the first three or four chapters of Joshua. And God parted the waters again. Must have been a wide swath that he made. One of my favorite stories in all the world is of uh, a little Pentecostal lady who got to church, was going to leave church for church late one day, and she knew she couldn't get across town to her little Pentecostal church. So she decided to go to the big first church down on the main corner, which was just around the street from her. And she knew they didn't preach the gospel and didn't believe anything, but she was late, so she just decided to go in there. And she sat down. Somebody handed her the bulletin, and she came in. And uh, the preacher was, uh, was, was just cold and, and didn't believe much of anything. But this old lady was so on fire for God. And at one point, the preacher said something, and she said, Hallelujah! And the place just froze. And the pastor lost his place and he had to go back. And a few minutes later, glory to God! It just ruined the service. And the little lady came back the next week because she kind of liked that revival fire in there, you know? And so the board met with the pastor and said, Pastor, we cannot have this crazy old Pentecostal woman coming into this church anymore. She is destroying our church. So we'll, we're going to have guards <laughs> at, at the door. And when she comes in, we're going to throw her out. Pastor said, no, we can't do that. He, he was a modernist, but he was a kind modernist. He said, we can't do that. He said, I'll tell you what, board. He said, next Sunday, I'm going to preach a sermon that is so dull and so boring that not even she can find anything to shout about. And the board left happy because they knew he could do that. <laughs> so the next Sunday morning, here she comes again. And the pastor said, this morning, I'm preaching the message entitled, Why There Is No Such Thing As a Miracle. Why? And he went to the book of Exodus, and he preached about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. He said, now many of you think that there was this great parting of the water 
But we know that's not true because we know there at the Red Sea or the Reed Sea where the Israelites crossed, the water was only about six to eight inches across and they waded across at which this little old lady jumped to her feet and said, Oh, thank you, God. Hallelujah. He said, You're not listening, lady. It was not a miracle. The water is only this deep there. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And she ran around a section of the fuse. He said, Lady, what is the matter with you? She said, oh, think of the miracle. God drowned the whole Egyptian army in eight inches of water. Hallelujah! I love that story. It's really just easier to believe the book, people. The bottom of page four, and I talked about this at some length last week, so I'm not going into detail, but you need to observe it again here. We believe that Joseph entered Egypt as the prime minister at the Hyksos dynasty, or the shepherd kings, who you can read about in your secular history books, who were not Egyptians. These were foreigners, probably from Canaan or Syria, who had conquered Egypt, and they were hated by the Egyptians whom they ruled in their own country. And uh, they treated Joseph's family with great respect, even though most of Egypt hated this line of Pharaoh. Finally, the Hyksos line of foreign kings was driven out of Egypt by a native Egyptian dynasty, which understandably was hostile to foreigners, and the Jews who lived in the delta there of the Nile were foreigners. Exodus says simply, there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Hated, hated any foreigners in their land and decided to drive them out. This was the Pharaoh of the oppression. Now it's in the book of Exodus that we get the travels of Israel across the Sinai. I've crossed the Sinai on numerous occasions. Um, you can drive from Cairo or the site of the old uh, Memphis city, which was the capital of, of Egypt back in those days. You can drive it clear up across the promised land uh, in, oh goodness, a half a day easy. And that's stopping to eat, crossing over the Suez Canal and so forth. But it took the Israelis 40 years to do it. Even walking, it should not have taken them more than a couple of months. It took them 40 years. At Mount Sinai, which is not like, um, like Pike's Peak or the Matterhorn, it's really just a glorified hill. We were there, is it last May we were there? Yeah, no, yeah, last May. And um, some of them went up to the top again and um, it's, it's not a terrible climb, but Moses made it when he was 80. And uh, it's very loose shale now. They've carved pathways and steps to get up. It's still quite a climb, but Moses didn't have the pathway and the steps. God said, come up to Mount Sinai, the top. And there was fire coming out of the top of the mountain. And Moses goes into that mountain, and he's there for almost seven weeks alone with God. When he came down, his face shone with the glory of God. And while he's up there, God gave him the Ten Commandments, which radically changed the way the Israelites would live. But he also gave them the whole concept of the tabernacle in the wilderness, I've preached a lot about the tabernacle. I love to study the tabernacle. Because if you never had the New Testament, you would know about salvation by studying the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I'll show you why in just a few minutes. In Exodus 25, God told Moses how he expected him to pay for it. Uh, Stanford Research Institute did a major study on the tabernacle, it must have been 30 years ago. 
And their estimate is that it cost the Jews, who had just been freed from 400 years of bondage, it cost them about $13.5 million to erect this portable shrine, this portable temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, because it was gold and the very finest of everything. And in chapter 25, here's how God told Moses he's going to pay for it. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. One offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. Not junk, fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate, which was a garment, a vest worn by the high priest. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Some years ago, I was so, oh, this must have been 25 years ago, I was so enamored by this whole study of the tabernacle, I spent years just studying it. And I found an old craftsman in Cleveland, Ohio, and asked him to make me a model of the tabernacle, one inch to the cubit. A cubit is from your elbow to your tip of your finger, about 18 inches. So it's on a 1 18th inch scale. And it's, it's very rickety anymore and fragile, and I don't set it up much anymore. But I'm going to show you a, a video. I made this video really for kids with Louis to show you what the tabernacle was really like. And I could stand here and try to describe it for you, but Louis can do a whole lot better uh, telling you the story himself. So if you'll roll it, pretend you're a kid for just a little bit and you'll learn something. Okay? Them, Remember, so this you. is a class for. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. Well, Louis, my boy, you look like you're headed for a play or something. I am. You're going to be in the play? No, I'm selling tickets. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. What are you going to be? Shepherd. Shepherd boy. Yeah. Well, you, that, that's great. You really look neat. Thank you. You're kind of dressed for the part. I, I just thought maybe this would be a good time to tell a great story out of the Old Testament, okay, that involved little boys like you and their mommies and daddies and their sisters and grandmas and grandpas. Good. I love stories. I know you do. And we've, we've told a lot of them down through the years. Have you ever heard about the tabernacle in the wilderness? Uh, what street is that on? No, 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 I'm not talking about a church today. I'm talking about, well, what was the original meeting place, the house of God, the tabernacle in the wilderness. The man who built the tabernacle was... <laughs> I don't have the clue. Moses. Oh, yeah, Moses. Really? Mm -hmm. You remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt? Oh, yeah, and the uh, frogs and the dogs and and the Nile and all that. Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, another. Uh -huh. They went across the Red Sea. Uh-huh, yeah. Drowned the Egyptians. That's right. Well, after they left the Red Sea, do you know where they went? No, I don't. They went to Mount Sinai. Uh-huh, where's that? Well, Mount Sinai is between Egypt and Israel, and it's out in the wilderness, and on top of Mount Sinai, God called Moses to a high summit meeting you might say and in that meeting on top of mount sinai god gave moses a couple of very important things what do you think they were a new car no no not even close an old car no 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 god gave moses the 10 the 10 10 cars no no the 10 commandments that's right the 10 commandments and he gave him something else up there too and you may not know what this one is, so I'm going to tell you. He gave Moses the plans for the first meeting place for people
to come before God. And that place was the tabernacle in the wilderness. Look here what I've got for us today, Louis. I've got a model that we have built of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And for the next little while, I'm going to take you clear through this. Wow, this is a dollhouse. No, it's not a dollhouse. Where's, where's Ken? Ken and Barbie? Yeah. Well, they're not here. This is something totally different. And we're going to take you and the boys and girls right through this because this tells about one of the most important factors anywhere in the Bible, this tabernacle in the wilderness. And not only is it very important, a very important Old Testament Bible story, but it has a lot to do with you and me today. It does. Mm -hmm. How? Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that to you. Now, Louis, this building right over here in the center was the tabernacle. And we've got kind of a little brown quilty cloth over the top of it here, but the original was made of badger hide. <laughs> no kidding! Wisconsin badgers! No, well, it wasn't Wisconsin badgers, but that's, that's kind of to look like badger hide from the Old Testament. And over here, you see the front of the tabernacle there? Oh, that's, that's neat. Red, blue. That's right. That, that's the outer veil. That's how you got inside the tabernacle. How big was it? The tabernacle? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't very big. This tabernacle, the full-size tabernacle, was only 15 feet wide. Yeah. And only 45 feet long. No kidding. And 15 feet high. 15 by 45 by 15 feet. Well, that's not very big. I know it's not very big. Who got in there? Well, you and I couldn't get in there. No? Mm -mm. We weren't allowed to go inside the tabernacle. Who was? The priests. Just the priests. And uh, only one priest could go in the back room of the tabernacle, which I'm going to show you on our next program. See, here are some little figures representing priests down here by the great altar. They were the ones in the Old Testament who made sacrifices to God for sin. See, you and I didn't go on our knees and say, Oh, God, forgive me for my sin. No. no. Well, then, how did, how did God do that? How did... How, how did we get our sins taken care of? Well, we would go to a priest like this, and we would bring a sheep, a little sheep. See the sheep over there in the corner, that little flock of sheep over there? Oh, you guys! Bring a little sheep over there, and a sheep would be sacrificed. What do you mean? Killed? That's right. The little sheep would be killed and would be laid on that altar and would be burned, and the, one of the priests would take the blood from the lamb, and that's what covered our sins. Oh, you're kidding. You didn't know that? No. See, now in the New Testament that we live in, Jesus is the lamb who takes all of our sins away. But all of this was done in the tabernacle in the wilderness. You know what the word portable means? Oh. Uh... No. It means that you can pick it up and take it with you. This whole tabernacle could be taken with the Israelites everywhere they went. Now, I've told you the main building here was 15 feet wide, 45 feet long, 15 feet high. Yeah. It was just for the priests, not for you and me. We got stopped right here by the veil. We couldn't go any further than that. Oh, yeah. Ooh. And we, all we could go to really was the altar over there. Now, this area outside of the tabernacle was known as the courtyard. And it was about 75 feet wide and about 150 feet long. Oh, what's this, uh, what's this uh, fence? That's called the linen enclosure. And it was a fence. It stood about 8 feet high. Now, since you brought up the fence, let me give you a couple of very interesting things. Do you know how you got into the courtyard? Well, you could just go under the fence. No, you couldn't. No? Uh -uh. Nobody could go under the fence. You couldn't climb over it. The only way you could get into the courtyard, see that opening over there? Yeah. That's on the eastern side. The tabernacle always faced the eastern direction. And that was the eastern gate. And the only way anybody could get inside the tabernacle courtyard was through the eastern gate. Well, I don't think so. You don't? No, I don't think so. How are you going to get in? Crawl under the fence. You are, huh? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Just crawl 
fall under the fence? I don't think so. How come? Because anyone who touched the fence, yeah, died. What? They died. Anybody who touched this sacred fence died. Of what? Well, they just died. Whether it was God or what it was, I'm not real sure, but God said whoever touches this fence to come in any other way but the eastern gate over there will die. Well, you know what? What? I'm coming in over there. I thought you might. I thought you might want to come in over there. That's the eastern gate. Now, very important truth here, Louie. Are you listening? Yeah, I sure am. Okay. The only way any person could ever get into the tabernacle in the Old Testament, ever come to the altar to have sins forgiven, see the great altar there? Yeah. With the priests? Uh-huh. Was to come through the eastern gate. Yeah. Now, that's the Old Testament. Yeah. We live in New Testament days, the time that Jesus came to die for our sins. Uh-huh. Jesus said, I, speaking of himself, I am the way. I am the way to God. So Jesus is to us our eastern gate. The only way we can come to have our sins forgiven, the only way we can come to God is through the eastern gate. And that eastern gate to us is Jesus. You ever hear that old song, I'll meet you in the morning just inside the eastern gate? Yeah, I, I, I heard that song. Uh -huh. That's referring to Jesus. Now see, Louis, here's the problem. Back in the Old Testament days, the presence of God, the physical presence of God, dwelt in a back room in this tabernacle. Now, God was everywhere. This is going to be kind of hard to explain to you. You know, God is everywhere. In the mountains. Mm -hmm. In the valleys. That's right. And the oceans, white with home. That's right. He's, God, God is everywhere. But in the Old Testament days, his physical presence was inside that inside room, which I'm going to show you in the next program. So the dilemma, the problem that every person had was, how do they get into the presence of God? Yeah. It's like today. How do we get to God? Through Jesus. That's right. But in the Old Testament days, before Jesus came, you know, born of Mary in Bethlehem? Yeah. And died on the cross? Yeah. How did people come to God before then? Oh, yeah, I, I see what you mean. They had to come into the tabernacle courtyard through that eastern gate, and there was no other way to come. There was no northern gate. There was no southern gate, no western gate. No, just the eastern. That's right, just the eastern gate. Now, who is our eastern gate? Jesus. That's right. You got that exactly right. Now, we come to the gate. Let's pretend that you're uh, living back in the days of Moses, okay? Okay. And you come through that eastern gate, and let's say that you've committed a sin. Now, that's hard to believe. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, let's just suppose that you'd done something wrong, and you needed God to forgive you, okay? Uh-huh. So you came through that eastern gate with a little lamb or a sheep, Oh, here we go. That's right. And you came to the priest and you said, I've sinned and I need forgiveness for my sin. And here's this sheep who's taking my place. This is my sacrifice for sin. And the priest would kill the lamb and lay it on that big brazen altar there. Yeah. And burn it and take the blood to apply over the altar to symbolize to God little Louis's sin was forgiven. Wow. You had to do that? That's right. That's the way people came to God. Now, once a year, the high priest, that's the priest there who's dressed up in all the bright clothes with all of the jewels on, on the vest, on the ephod of his clothing. That's what that is called. He was the high priest. Once a year, the high priest would come way inside the tabernacle here, and he'd go back to that inner room where the presence of God was. Ooh, I bet that was scary. Well, it was a little bit uh, frightening to be sure because the presence of God was something. And before he could ever go into that first veil there, or any of the priests could, 
and do any work inside the tabernacle, they had to come to this laver right down here. You see that? Yeah. That's the laver of cleansing. And they had to wash and they had to be clean. Now, Louis, there's a real tie there with you and me on this. What is it? Well, you and I come through the eastern gate. That's Jesus. Yeah. We come to the altar. That's the cross. That's the cross. That's right. And there our sins are forgiven. But God wants us to live clean lives. Now, where do you and I wash to be clean? Ah, uh, I don't know. The Bible. Really? Mm-hmm. The Bible says that the scripture is given to us for our daily washing and cleansing. Do you read the Bible? Well, yeah. Every day? Uh, Every day? Uh, no. Well, you need to read it every day so you can be clean. That's very, very important. Now, we're going to come back to the tabernacle next time, and we're going to open it up, and we're going to go inside. What have we learned today? Don't mess with that fence. <laughs> That's right. Come in the gate. Come in the gate, the eastern gate in the Old Testament, and our gate is Jesus. That's right. And we need to be clean. What makes us clean? The Bible. The Word of God. That's right. Now, did you notice these pillars down here? You know what those are? Cotton candy. Candy. Well, they look like it. You didn't try to bite one of those, did you? It's the worst cotton candy I ever had. Well, those are representative of two very important things in the tabernacle in the wilderness. The red one was the pillar of fire, Woo! and the white one was the cloud of smoke. And next time we meet, you remember to ask me about the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke because they're very important. And then we're going to open up all the inside of the tabernacle and we're going to see what's in there. What do you think's in there? Well, I, I don't know. There's no window. I know it, but we'll open it up next time, okay? And you're going to see some incredible things inside there. Now, what do we call all of this? The uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. That's right. That's right. Not a very big building. No, but really urgent. That's right. Very urgent. And we'll pick it up next time with the tabernacle in the wilderness. I like it. I like it. Okay. Okay. Well, it kind of helps to understand. And the book of Exodus is about redemption. You never had the New Testament, just with the tabernacle in the wilderness, you could show someone how to be saved. The theme of salvation runs all through all 66 books of the Bible. It's not some new deal that started with Matthew. It runs through it all. This is why you need to know the Old Testament. And this is why you need to read through the Bible in 90 days, and everybody said. It's getting weaker. Book of Leviticus, middle of page 5. In the book of Leviticus, the children of Israel were marking time at Mount Sinai. The book opens and closes at the same geographical spot, Mount Sinai, where God gave the law. Exodus closed with the construction of the tabernacle. Leviticus continues by giving the order and the rules of worship in the tabernacle. Leviticus is not an easy book to read. I will tell you, but it's a vital one. It's a vital one. It's called the book of worship. What does worship really mean? Sacrifice, ceremony, ritual, liturgy, instructions, washings, convocations, holy days, observances, conditions, and warnings crowd this book. But there are great spiritual truths that we learn, and I've jotted down a few of these. The keynote to Leviticus is holiness unto the Lord. Holiness, the word holiness occurs 87 times in the book. Holiness means moral, spiritual health. God says, be ye holy, be ye healthy, as I am healthy. We live in a very sick, 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 sick world. God doesn't want you to be sick. He wants you to be well. He wants you to be healthy, morally, spiritually healthy. Leviticus 20, 26, and ye shall be holy unto me. 
I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Leviticus, Leviticus teaches that the way to God is by sacrifice. The word atonement, which means to cover up, occurs 45 times. The blood of bulls and goats would not actually take away sin. Louis told you about the sheep that were killed there on the altar. And then the high priest would take the blood and he would dab it on the altar. And once a year take the blood into the Holy of Holies for the sins of the nation. But it didn't take the sin away, it just covered it up. Notice that, it just covered it up. Atonement means to cover it up. But when Jesus comes on the scene, how does John the Baptist introduce him? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away, man, that's good, isn't it? Takes away the sins of the world, not just covers it up. A brief synopsis of the book, the five offerings which open this book are clear cameos of Christ. When you read this book in your 90 day journey, this will help you. The consecration of the priest reveals how shallow and adequate is our thinking of Christian consecration. That's the truth. In uh, the number C there on page six, you talk about the diet. This primarily is the kosher diet that our Jewish friends observed, which was sanitary, therapeutic. That's in chapter 11. In, in uh, item D, attention is given to motherhood in chapter 12. Number E, prominence is given to leprosy and its treatment. Leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible. And you can read the rest of those as you go along. Look at the box at the bottom of page six. In Genesis, we see man ruined by sin. In Exodus, we see man redeemed through the whole study of the tabernacle and the sacrifices. In Leviticus, we see man worshiping God. Page seven, we come to the book of Numbers. I love the book of Numbers. I've told you this before, but sometimes I have pastors say to me, oh, you're all hung up on Numbers. Numbers are not important. There's a whole book of the Bible called Numbers. Numbers are important. The book of Numbers, the, the word Numbers here means arithmetic because of the census that was taken in chapters one and 26. Numbers takes up the story where Exodus ends. In that box is a good review for you. In Genesis, we have the creation, the fall of man, and many beginnings. We have the beginning of Israel, not a nation yet, but a growing family that migrates to Egypt to escape extinction by famine. In Exodus, we find the family becoming a nation in Egypt. We see them in slavery. Then God delivers them by the hand of Moses, brings them clear up to Mount Sinai. In Leviticus, we see the Israelites marking time at Mount Sinai while God gives them the law, the way he wants them to live. In Numbers, we see the children of Israel depart from Mount Sinai and march to the area known as Kadesh or Kadesh Barnea, up much closer to the promised land, a couple hundred miles. Here they lose faith. Boy, I'd like to have about two hours on this one. Here the people lose faith and victory and an entire generation. Are you aware that of those several million people who left Egypt under Moses, only two people ever got into the promised land? Two out of several million. They were Joshua and Caleb. Why? They were the only two who showed faith and vision. An entire generation dies in the wilderness. Number three on page seven says, Leviticus shows us clearly how futile our lives become without faith. The distance from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea in North Sinai is only about 150 to 200 miles. The Israelites covered that jaunt in just 11 days. They could have been in the promised land in a mere 40 days, God going before them. Yet it required 40 years or so and resulted in the deaths of all those who left. Moses sent out the 12 spies. They saw this wonderful land of the promised land that was given to them. The land that even today we see of Israel is not the land. It is the land, but it's not the same way it was when God promised it. This land flowing with milk and honey. <clears throat> Over the centuries, Israel has been denuded and harmed and 
and uh, environmentally torn to pieces. It's not the land that it used to be. The Turks, for example, cut all the trees down in Galilee. When the Jews started going back there 100 years ago, it was a malarial swamp. But that's not the way it was when God promised it to them. So the 12 spies come in, and they come back to Moses, and they said, it's terrific. I mean, they've got these, these wonderful groves of, of fruit, and they've got these vineyards, and it's just wonderful, except there's giants in the land. They will kill us. Joshua and Caleb, referring to the 10 non-believers, said, well, what they say is true, but we can defeat them because we go in the name of God. But the Israelites believed the 10 spies. And out of fear, God never meant for you to live in fear. Out of unbelief, doubt, lack of faith, killed them all. God didn't kill them. Their lack of faith did. They died in the wilderness. It's a really sad story. There's a drawing on page 8 that shows how the people camped out every night. This was not some mob going through the wilderness helter-skelter. God's always been a God of great order. In, uh, on page 8, number 5, in Numbers, we read the deaths of Miriam and Aaron, Moses' sister and brother, chapter 20. Chapters 22 to 25, you study the life of a strange prophet named Balaam, who was spoken to by a donkey. In chapters 22 to 25, in chapters 13 and 14, the story I just told you of the spies going into the promised land. Chapter 21 is one of the stories, the story of the brazen serpent. National Geographic, you get National Geographic? It's a wonderful magazine. About four or five years ago, they did a story on these little vipers that appear here in the wilderness. And it even had picture. You can hardly see it. All you can see are tiny little red eyes peering up through the grains of sand in the form of a triangular head in the sand. You just cannot see them except by these wonderful lenses that they have. And they travel, they travel in groups of hundreds of thousands, and they bury themselves under the sand. You can't see them. So here come the Israelites, bare feet or sandals, and boy, they start getting hit by these vipers, which is a relative of a cobra, and also one of our own coral snake here. And the venom is deadly because it attacks not only the blood system, but also attacks the nervous system, and the deaths are terrible. So they're shuffling across this sand, and these snakes are hitting them. And God said to Moses, get a pole and make you a brass serpent and hang it on the pole. And tell them, anybody who looks at the snake on the pole will live. All they have to do is look at the brazen serpent, and they will live. And we're told the story here, the incredible story. There were people who said, we're not going to look at it. We don't believe it. And they died. All they had to do was look at the serpent on the pole, which was a precursor, a forerunner of the cross. Jesus dying on the cross. Look and live. Remember that old song? Look and live. Look and live. Look at the cross. Believe in what Jesus did, the one hanging on the cross. And all the poison of sin can be taken out of your life. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. Chapters 35, you read the story of the cities of refuge. That's a whole series in itself. Deuteronomy. The Greek word deutero means two or second. Dominion means law. So the title Deuteronomy means second law. Primarily God's reminding of his statutes and how he expects them to be maintained. The theme is love and obey. The word love appears 22 times. Moses wrote the book. Psalm 103, 7 verifies that. He made his ways known unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Now this section also tells about the death of Moses. Chapter 34, verses 5 to 12, probably written by Joshua. And it really belongs to the book of Joshua. Now we believe the word of God is inspired of God and is perfect. But the chapters and verse numbers are man-made. They're not perfect. And there are times when there ought to be a continuum of, of uh, the story, and instead there's a chapter heading or verse heading that really throws you off your feed there a little bit. And, uh, and this is one of them. When the children of Israel reached the border of the Promised Land, it was a new generation 
40 years after deliverance from Israel. The adults of the generation which had left Egypt were dead, their bones bleaching beneath the desert skies because of unbelief and disobedience. The new generation needed to have the law interpreted for them. So Moses gives to this new generation in Deuteronomy eight orations in which he reviews the desert experiences. He reminds them of the past. Dottie Rambo wrote, turn back the curtains of memory now and then. Show me, show me what I might have been and what I could have been. Isn't that it? He reemphasizes certain features of the law and he reveals the future course that God made with him relative to the land of promise. Last May, we went up to Mount Nebo. Uh, today, when you go down to Jericho, if you look to the southwest across the Dead Sea, you see this, it's usually hazy down there, but you can see this bluish black silhouette of, of a mountain. It's not like this, it's, it's a ridge really. It's Mount Nebo. Somewhere on Mount Nebo, God took Moses and showed him the promised land. And Moses died there. And we stood on that spot. There's a wonderful little church built up there. Beautiful little church. Been there for, I guess, hundreds of years. I don't know. And we looked across this place that where Moses stood and God spoke to him. Look at chapter 34, verses 1 to 8. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. So many of the old hymns refer to, I've been on Mount Pisgah's lofty height. People say, what is a Pisgah? You know, they got to read the Old Testament. See? And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, way up in the north, Dan the north, Beersheba on the south, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah. That's where the tribes divided up the land unto the utmost sea, which was the Mediterranean on the west, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Why? because yeah, Moses disobeyed God. He blew his cool. They'd been way down in the south end of the land we know today as Jordan, and so dry down there, not too far from Petra. And there's still a village there called Wadi Musa, the well of Moses, Wadi Musa. And the people were murmuring and complaining, and Moses didn't have the longest fuse to begin with. He's kind of like Paul. And he was just getting madder and madder. And God said to him, take the, take the leaders of Israel over this ridge and I'll show them all the water they want. There's a big rock there. There's no water actually there, but there's a big rock. Speak to the rock, just speak to it, and water will pour out of it. So <laughs> Moses leads the, these leaders of Israel over this rise. I've walked it over it, and I tried to relive it. Man, it, it is so real to me. And he said, rejoice, people. God's going to give us water. Oh, thank God. We're parched. We're going to die. And he takes them over the ridge, and there's nothing there but a rock about four times the size of this church. And Moses says, there! What? It's a rock! What kind of a leader are you? And Moses just blew his cool. And he took his big staff, his walking stick, and he said, must I show you a miracle? And he walked over and he hit the rock. I mean, he really hit it. There's still a hole there today. <laughs> True. And water gushed out of the rock. And the people said, oh, Moses, Moses, what a wonderful leader you are. And they started filling up all their water pots. Water still, it's the whole water supply for the whole village of Wadi Musa. Delicious, cold, icy water coming out of the rock. And the people are rejoicing. They're having a revival. And God said to Moses, come here. What? Moses, what did I tell you to do? Well, take the people over there. 
Did I tell you to speak to the rock or hit the rock? Uh, speak to it. What did you do? I hit it. Did I tell you to tell those people, must I, Moses, show you a miracle? No, no, no. So Moses, because you did this, you're not going to take the people into the promised land. Moses did get into the promised land. You know, later on in the time of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is Mount Hermon probably, but not at this time. And he died, and the Lord buried him. Moses, verse 7 says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. That means he still could have made a woman pregnant. That's what that means. We heard a testimony from right back here. And I say that because when there's questions, what, what, what did that mean? Well, I just told you. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Cecil Francis Alexander wrote, By Nebo's lonely mountain on this side Jordan's wave, in a vale in the land of Moab there lies a lonely grave. And no man knows that sepulcher, and no man saw it ere, for the angels of God upturned the sod and laid the dead man that's good. So in two weeks when we meet again, uh, we'll pick up the historical books. Now you've got millions of people gathered on the east bank of Jordan. You hear about the west bank of Jordan, all, or of Israel all the time. They're on the east bank. They're in the country we know today as Jordan. They've got to get across, and their first conquest is going to be Jericho. And so from Joshua right on to the book of Esther, those 12 books are known as the historical books. Is this helping you at all? Yes. Well, I hope.